ladies and gentlemen welcome back it's a matter of pride for us to have amidst us our exidotian mr hari haran who has launched various social initiatives as a tribute to our founder late shri gb mimamsi ji on this occasion of cdot's 36th foundation day and gb mimamsi lecture series i would like to invite mr hari haran on stage to tell us more about these initiatives thank you very much uh, good morning all uh, fellow cdotians visiting dignitaries shri vipin tyagi uh, see for the last maybe a day day and a half all the visitors to cdot would have had a chance to see the wonderful technology that cdot has developed but one of the unique aspects of cdot is the cdot culture and the openness of cdot when i came in when i arrived about 10 minutes ago i walked into the reception and she says who do you want to see i said i want to see mr vipin tyagi and then she says which organization do you represent and i said look i am an ex cdotian and she said please welcome sir and immediately she gave me a pass so this openness and this friendliness is very very much core to i think the cdot spirit and with, when we talk about the cdot spirit one cannot help but remember mr gb mimamsi hands up people who have personally either worked or you know known mr gb mimamsi okay so i, th I think uh, you can you can relate to my emotions and my sentiments see if you go on google and you put the name mimamsi there is only one mimamsi who comes you know and that is mr gb mimamsi gb mimamsi and his wife shankari mimamsi were an integral part of this organization and they they didn't have any children of their own and so they treated each and every person who was a cdot employee as their own child you know that was the love and affection which they had for us so it has always been in my heart that we have to do something collectively which can keep the name and memory of mr mimamsi alive so last year i got this opportunity the rotary club of jamshedpur have been successfully running a mother and child clinic for 47 years at a place called bhilai pahadi they wanted to duplicate this effort and start another such center and they said hari i mean uh, we need your help in raising funds for this center i jumped on this opportunity and basically i said look if you give me the naming rights for this center i want to call it you know the mimamsi center for mother and child health then we will do whatever is necessary for you guys to get the funds see rotary has got the experience to do these kind of projects they have got very very strong governance in place and for these reasons i chose rotary as a partner for this initiative so i'll quickly summarize you know what this initiative is so basically we have this agreement with the rotary where rotary has established this clinic at a place in near jamshedpur called keradongri and and uh, because they've had the experience they're not actually going through a learning process they know how to do these things initially it was launched in june but there were some teething troubles so those teething troubles have been overcome and now effectively from say the uh, beginning of this year around feb this clinic has been running continuously they they see around 60 to 80 expectant mothers or other mothers who have just delivered and 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 they provide like a weekly healthcare to them there is a doctor dr shashi chavla who is a rotarian herself who is donating her time and effort you know so she goes there once a week every sunday and the clinic is run with the assistance of other volunteers from the rotary club there is a very very nominal charge you know which is being charged of these patients because i think one of the important things i have learned you know in, in in when we do social initiatives initiatives and so called charity is in order to preserve the dignity of people you have to allow them to pay a little bit make a little contribution themselves then they feel a bigger part of the initiative so that's why we have a very very nominal charge but then effectively we are funding the initiative this charge is just you know a very token amount 
And, and also the other thing that we do is for a lot of the expectant mothers, their main need more than medication is nutrition. So we provide them with some kind of a food supplement every month. So here, these are some pictures, you know, of, of the center. It's actually a very beautiful place just outside Jamshedpur. Just shows the clinic in operation. So that is Dr. Shashi Chavla. This is just a day at the clinic. Medicines are given out free to all patients. So basically that's it. This is the Mimamsi Mother and Child Health Center, which we have started in Keradongri in Jamshedpur. And I request all CDOTians past and present to support this venture and donate freely of any you know, time and money that you have. Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, sir, for briefing us about the various social initiatives as a tribute to our founder, Sri G. B. Mimamsi. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session focuses on the standardized implementation of smart cities. I would like to request the esteemed members of this panel to please take their respective seats on the dais. We have with us Mr. Rahul Kapoor, Director of Smart Cities, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. Due to an urgent assignment, Mr. Kunal Kumar would not be able to join us. In his place, Mr. Rahul Kapoor would be a part of the panel. Mr. Christoph Collinet, Smart City Project Manager, Metropole Bordu. Mr. V. Raghunandan, Deputy Director General, International Relations, Department of Telecommunications, Government of India. <laughs> Professor Ramesh Loganathan, International Institute of Information Technology, IIIT Hyderabad. We would also be joined by Mr. Son Mong Jong and Mr. Dale Seed, who would be connecting with us through their video talks in the conference. May I now request Mr. Sondra Kumar, Director CDOT, to formally welcome the esteemed members of this panel. Mr. Rahul Kapoor, Director Smart Cities, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Christoph Collinet, Smart City Project Manager, Metropole Bordu. We extend a very warm and hearty welcome to you, sir. Mr. V. Raghunandan, Deputy Director General, International Relations, Department of Telecommunications, Government of India. We welcome you, sir. Professor Ramesh Loganathan, International Institute of Information Technology, IIIT Hyderabad. We extend a very warm and hearty welcome to you, sir. We would also like to extend our warm welcome to Mr. Song Mong Jong and Mr. Dale Seed for joining us with us in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, we have in the midst of us Mr. Rahul Kapoor, who is currently the Director of Smart Cities in the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. An officer of the Indian Railways Account Service, Mr. Rahul holds a degree in economics and master's degree in business economics from the University of Delhi. As a director in the mission, he's driving the mission's initiative on smart solutions in the core infrastructure to improve the quality of life of the citizens. 
He is also the mission data officer, driving the data initiatives of the Smart Cities mission. Mr. Kapoor has a wide and diverse experience in the field of government infrastructure and finance in various public-private partnership projects. Sir, may I request you to deliver your keynote on the standardized implementations of smart cities. A very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for a bit of delay due to an unprecedented meeting in the ministry. I uh, got held back. But anyway, I'm happy to be here, being part of the 36th Foundation Day celebration of CDOT. And just to talk a bit about CDOT, I think it's a beautiful campus you have over here while entering. It's really nice. And a lot of work has been done in the field of standardization in various parts of the world and something we are trying to do in India when it comes to the smart cities. To talk about it, the mission was started in 2015. Some of you uh, may be aware of it. So I'd just like to briefly touch upon what the smart cities mission is all about and what it has been doing. So it's about 100 cities and affecting the lives of 100 million people. How is the mission planning to do this? It's by providing core infrastructure solutions, and providing infrastructure, improving the quality of life of citizens. And there has been a very comprehensive selection process in selection of these 100 cities. It was basically based on the spirit of competitive and cooperative federalism, wherein there was a challenge process. These cities came up with the smart cities proposals. And after going through the challenge, 100 cities were selected. And Today, they are all implementing their projects and they are at uh, different levels of progression. And if you look at it, the main focus of this mission has been on people. With the people at center, the aspirations, if you can see on the right side of this uh, slide, these are what citizens aspire for, be in terms of ease of living, in terms of economic growth that they look for. So people are the focus and with that, the outcomes are actually linked to these aspirations of the mission. And if you look at it, the ministry or the cities are basically trying to provide the infrastructure and the services and also link the information built around people and working on the quadruple helix. Now, this is the collaboration of government, industry, academia, and citizenry who will work together and try and provide those kind of solutions which the urban challenges require today. The enablers or the levers will be the capacity building, research, innovation, finance, and technology. So we'll be trying to build the platforms to deliver. So if you look at it, you can say that three foundational pillars of the mission would be the people, the processes that go around it, and the platforms that will be the enablers. So why is there a need for standardization? So as I mentioned that, the objective is to promote cities that provide core infrastructure and give decent quality of life to citizens in a clean, sustainable environment through applications of smart solutions. Now, a smart city needs smart governance, business, and uh, the scale of infrastructure and services being developed are so diverse and so varied that replicating it across becomes a challenge. I mean, we have situations wherein, let us say, one particular city is investing in a smart pool uh, solution, and suddenly they decide to increase the scope beyond the ABD area, which is the area of development, and they realize that the services are not interoperable. There's a different vendor. There are vendor lock-in issues. There are scalability issues. These are the kind of challenges we face today, and that's why the need for standardization is there. I think all of us, uh, over the last uh, day, we must have discussed this at length on why there is a need for standardization. So I'll not go too much into it, but I'll just mention that, yes, these are the core issues that our cities are facing, the issues of interoperability with different kind of systems, different kind of vendors. There are issues that you have systems which are working on different platforms. Scalability, 
which I just mentioned that example, trying to increase the existing project, and replicability. What best practices are being implemented in one city, whether they are easily replicable in other cities or not? How will you ensure that? And doing it at speed. So this is where standards help. If things are standardized, then obviously you can implement your projects and systems at scale and speed, which will eventually lead to catalyzation of the economic growth in the country and overall social mobility, inclusiveness, and sustainability objectives will be attained. Now, if I would just like to say that if I can divide the aspirations of people into three parts, then I would say that economic ability, quality of life, and sustainability would be the three things we all aspire for. From a citizen's perspective, quality of life would be better roads, better health care, better education. And then we look at jobs, and we look at growth opportunities, and we look at economic uh, opportunities that are there in the city. And sustainability is the resilience that a city provides in terms of green spaces, disaster management and mitigation strategies that the cities adopt. So if we look at these three outcomes, then we have to basically devise our overall objective or strategy towards these three. And the functions of the performance of the municipality would depend on five parameters, which I can say the services that the urban local bodies would be providing to these uh, achievements of these outcomes. With regard to finance, in terms of how well you are managing your expenditure and your revenue sources that you're able to generate in your city, the kind of planning that you do as an urban local body or an, as an administrator, how effective are your plans getting implemented? The technology that you're using, the kind of platforms that you're developing to provide better governance, and finally, the people, the administrators, the staff, the team that are actually working in the cities who are trying to meet these outcomes. So how do you make their lives better? How do you make them more efficient? That's where the role of data comes in. Now, data is the enabler which will actually help in uh, moving towards this data-driven governance and performance management system that we want to create for our cities. Now, we have been creating frameworks in this regard. So we have created the ease of living uh, framework, which actually talks about these three pillars of quality of life, economic ability, and sustainability. And for the urban local bodies' performance, we have created an indicator called uh, Municipal Performance Index Framework. Now, with these indicator frameworks, what you need is a lot of data. And for that, you need to have a data-driven governance and data ecosystem in your cities. But currently, we all understand that that is the biggest challenge, that data today is available, but in silos. There are various government departments, government, uh, each having their own systems, each working in their own uh, work domains. But there's very little exchange that actually takes place. So with keeping this in mind, we came out with a data smart city strategy. And that data smart city strategy is basically the roadmap for creating this culture of data in our cities. It has basically focused on these three pillars of, again, people, on what kind of capacity building initiatives are needed, what kind of teams you require, what kind of training would be required to actually instill this culture of data in cities. Second is the processes. How are you going to collect your data? What kind of standards uh, you would be creating? So that's where the role of standards come in. So, and third part would be the platforms. Now, how to create those enabling platforms and move away from a systems approach where instead of designing things and doing everything, you create those enablers where these four actors of the quadruple helix that we talked about, the government, industry, academia, and citizenry can all come together and collaborate. Getting those platforms up and running, getting those processes in place, and instilling the right kind of people in the city, that's what the data-driven governance strategy is all about. And that's what the data smart strategy talks about. Standardization is one core component of this, which will basically cut across the various, uh, uh, the various initiatives and the various functionalities that we are trying to create in this. So we have come out with a data smart city strategy and there is a maturity assessment framework, which again tries to assess cities in terms of the systemic and uh, sectoral maturities. And uh, we've also created an open data, uh, urban data exchange. And what this, uh, uh, sorry, an open da uh, urban data exchange platform we have tried to create with IISC Bangalore. And what this urban data exchange platform tries to do is it tries to get all these different uh, eco ecosystem actors together on a platform wherein they can facilitate the exchange of data. And that's where the role of standards become important because how different departments having different data sets, different systems will be able to come together and exchange uh, data, that will be very important.
Another initiative of the ministry, the Smart Cities Open Data Portal to assess and the, uh, tap the potential of data in cities and drive innovation. So we have got 100 smart cities and we have got 100 city data officers already in place. These data officers are now beginning to uh, populate uh, the portal with city data, which can help the various people come together and use it to create innovative solutions for cities' problems. Now, this is just the first step, but then again, we come up with the same questions on what kind of standards would be there for data collection, on how you're going to basically uh, exchange data, what would be the rules, regulations. I think standards just cut across everywhere. <coughs> and if you look at the initiators of the mission, we have done extensive work on trying to create smart city standards. There are partners like BIS who's here with us. We have TEC, we have CDOT assisting us in the creation of these standards in various domains like ICT, like mobility, energy, and infrastructure. And objective is that let us standardize the smart city solutions so that no one city will have to face the same challenges which another city has already overcome. No one vendor will have to basically look at uh, devising you know, new solutions each and every time. So the security concerns are also addressed because of this, so that has to be a key focus here. The platforms that we design should be, uh, the standards that we design should be platform agnostics. There has to be backward compatibility because there are a lot of systems and a lot of investments that have already taken place in our smart cities. There are uh, examples uh, galore where there's a new system and suddenly the technology changes and uh, we have problems in uh, the entire investment just goes sunk. For ex I'll just give you an example. In NDMC, they created a smart parking lot with handheld meters and they were working on uh, 4G technology and suddenly LT comes in and uh, these uh, handheld devices are just not operable. So these are the issues which we also need to consider when new standards are devised, when new technology is getting developed. Capacity building is integral to this, and we have to have an integrated approach wherein it's just not uh, one person trying to develop standards. I think that's the whole beauty about uh, developing standards. You know, like everybody should be part of it. It has to be the industry, the users, the government uh, users, in fact, and uh, academic institutions who definitely contribute towards this. So having an integrated approach towards standards development is a core uh, part of our standards uh, development efforts, which we are trying to do in the mission. So, of course, it covers processes, it covers the terminologies and semantics, the KPIs that we want to talk about, technology components, and how data can be reused. CDOT has been making, uh, has been uh, taking a lot of effort in trying to create these standards for us, along with BIS, along with uh, TEC, who have been developing telecom standards for us, and I think uh, very soon we will be coming out with the smart city standards in ICT and with the other uh, segments that I talked about. So I am sure that these segments have been given due weightage and importance by the core committees that have been formed, and we'll very soon have very comprehensive and interoperable standards and subsystems. So I once again compliment CDOT, TEC, BIC, and other organizations for their uh, untiring efforts in focusing on this important and challenging needs of standardization activities. And last but not least, I'm sure the deliberations that have been done over the last, uh, during this conference, would help us in basically scaling up our efforts and uh, speedily helping us in developing these standards. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your elaborate account of the Smart Cities mission of the Government of India. Our next speaker in this session is Mr. Christoph Collinet. Mr. Collinet joined the city of Bordu in 2005 as head of operational maintenance for city's server infrastructure and is currently the in charge of digital activities for Bordu Metropole. Mr. Christoph became the Smart City project manager for the new directorate coordinating European projects. He is the Bordu representative within the Euro Cities Knowledge Society Forum, where he also chairs the Standards and Interoperability Working Group. In 2017, Mr. Christoph became an ambassador of the Smart Building Alliance and vice chairman of the Smart Building for Smart Cities Commission. 
At the beginning of 2019, Bordeaux also became a member of the global network of open and agile smart cities at its own initiative. So, may I request you to share your experiences of smart city implementations at Metropole Bordeaux and EuroCities. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, the CDOT, for uh, your welcome here. And uh, it's the third time for me to be, to be here, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, and I would like also to thank a lot uh, uh, the India EU ICT project to give, to give me the opportunity to be there, and uh, Stan ICT, Indico, which are the European project we which allowed me to, which gave me the possibility to be there. So, um, first of all, I would like to set the scene of, uh, uh, to share with you the essentials and the public sector concerns I represent. For uh, um, 10 years, around 10 years, we face new uh, service disintermediation which means new providers coming in the, in the territory we can't um, manage. They just arrive and uh, uh, we just have to take care about, like for example, uh, those uh, free floating bags coming from China, Mobike, which came in the, in the sidewalks of the city. We just had to, to uh, make uh, things go properly, but we had to suffer from this uh, savage installation, this tsunami of bikes. We, ha we had exactly the same situation with throttles six months ago. So we see new services which arise, we can do anything, so we have to be adaptive. Um, and we also have existing providers which uh, um, try to transform the organization in order to uh, to be um, conformant to these new uh, direct access to the citizens like big companies in France, AFAG, Fancy, Bouygues, um, and of course, you know, the, the well-known Uber and Airbnb. Um, for us, it's especially an issue looking at Airbnb because uh, Many of people can't even live in the center of the city due to these uh, new services, uh, and it's really an issue. So what are the levers we have as a city administration? I think uh, uh, the minister before just said we have, of course, ICT. ICT is a good way to manage data, to drive city assets, and to support the decision making. The, the second one is governance, the fundamental pillar. We have a very rich um, stakeholders. Um, we have many stakeholders on the acting on the territory. We can look at the utilities, at the city administration, at the, the new services I spoke about before, and all this has to be managed. So the governance is also a fundamental pillar. I won't detail today because of the time, but we, we may uh, discuss during uh, uh, the breaks if uh, necessary. And the third one, and not uh, the least, is uh, citizen. More and more we see that citizens are a key and privileged player which might be put at the heart of the design of the new smart city services. If we don't, we have results like we can uh, see now in France with uh, the new methods in the electricity distribution, people reject and they don't want those kind of installation without their agreement. 
um, they feel it's uh, a big brother inside their home. So we have to take care about citizens and the way they can accept those new services. So uh, ICT is the first lever. It's, I think, the simple one. We have already many, many solutions, standardized solutions, and we can distinguish between, uh, it's a, a bit like a, a human body. You have the skeleton, which is uh, telecommunication and uh, sensors, and you have the brain, uh, with compared to the management platform you were talking uh, about just before Mr. Uh, Kapoor. Um, citizen. If we look at the citizen, um, the citizen now are aware of what is done with their data. So you, you can see many and many movements uh, emerging, which are claiming for universal and equal access to the internet, to the privacy and the data protection and security, to transparency, accountability, non-discrimination of data content, and to be more participative, to we, we have more and more um, participative budgets in the in the communities now uh, and they want really to be included in the policy making and they want also some open and ethical digital service standards so this this is, is not something i um, uh, invented this is something which is coming from the united nations human settlements so this is something which is really important and we have to take into account as a city administration and looking at this uh, uh, I would say uh, initiative the cities for six months in Europe in Europe and all over the world because it's an initiative coming from New York and Barcelona uh, they created a coalition, coalition for digital rights. So it's a national organization, but already we can see that after about six months, we have first very interesting outcomes. We can see that 45 members from five continents have joined, six languages for the principles, so English, Spanish, Catalan, French, Italian, and Albanian, and perhaps next Indian, we have to discuss about this. And international gatherings, of course the Smart City Expo in Barcelona is uh, the best known. Three conferences from, from Euro cities, from New York, the New York City forums, global partners, United Nations, United Nations Habitat, United Nations Human Rights and United Cities and Local Government three international organizations adopting digital rights principle, the uh, G20 in Tokyo. There was a communique in Tokyo during the last uh, G20. It was in June, if I do remember well. And a uh, US conference of, May of mayors uh, resolutions, which uh, took place in May 2019. And you can also access to the information in the website of the coalition. So citizens have concerns, the cities try to react towards those concerns. Uh, so this is, and you talked about interoperability, this is why interoperability is key. Don't look at the picture, it's, the, it's not really uh, understandable. It's, it's just to show that uh, smart city services have to take into account a complex ecosystem. And that is just for mobility services. So uh, the interoperability is key for two points. The first one is, like we saw before, to ensure citizen digital right protection. If you are not able to 
to control the, the data acquisition, you won't be able to, uh, to ensure the sovereignty of the data. And they won't, you won't be able to be um, honest towards the citizen. Uh, and the second one is to avoid the vendor lock-in and to stimulate the market. So why stimulate the market? Because if you give confidence in the, in the customers, you automatically you will have a market which will be uh, able to go for one more smoothly. Otherwise, you will always uh, be anxious about uh, acquiring a new system. So interoperability is key, and what if there is a lack of interoperability? I found this example about what happened in India, uh, I think, uh, one year before, and it was about uh, uh, EV charges and the problem of uh, compatibility of the Chinese and Japanese electrical vehicle, vehicles. Sorry. Um, the, the result is you have to deploy twice the infrastructure, so it is a question of time, time to be ready to give people uh, the possibility to, to recharge and money because if you have to buy twice the AV charges, you have to pay twice. But standards doesn't mean necessary interoperability. When I took my position in uh, 2016 as smart city manager, um, I first met my colleagues from the other departments. And I first met the guy in charge of energy and explained it was very important to, to use standardized solutions, standardized services. He said, OK, don't worry about this, Christophe. We are full Kinex. And then, I went around, I saw my colleague from the building talking about the same issues, and he said, yeah, no, no, we are fully compatible with BACnet. And those different standards are real standards. But if you don't have a look at the whole big picture, you will miss something. I don't talk about the different way of accessing to the data, Wi-Fi, fiber optical, LoRa, Sigfox, and so on and so far. So everything is standardized in the picture you can see, but nothing talks which is other. So you have to be more interoperable than standardized. And the most is interoperability standardized. So, oh, sorry. How to transform this heter heterogeneous, it's a name I have always big problem to speak about, heterogeneous, it's not the same, and siloed legacy infrastructure towards interoperable and industrial smart city services. You have, I talk about Europe, you have many different partners in Europe um, involved in the smart city uh, implementation. So you have, of course, the standardization bodies, let's see, Senelec. You have networks uh, of cities, European networks of cities, EuroCities, Open and Agile Smart Cities, and you have the European project. If you put all those different stakeholders together and if you make them work together properly, that's a way to bring interoperability. There is another condition. You have to include the users in the process of standardization. In 2015, we created a, um, not a coalition, but a, a group in, uh, inside Etsy, which is EG for you, eGreen for users. It's uh, an NGO looking at ICT, of course, and uh, gathering users from public and private sector working together to improve energy management, waste monitoring in three domains, ICT sites, smart cities, and electrical and electronic equipment. 
And um, this uh, AG4U group is a Etsy member, and I thank Etsy to allow us to do so because it was really fruitful. We uh, already, uh, thanks to the creation of working group, could uh, create standardization. You were talking about KPIs. We already published a technical specification in 2017, which is a 103, 463, which is now published, uh, to define KPIs for smart cities. So that's if this is something which is interesting for you, I would be pleased to share it. Uh, because it was a, a, a great a great job and a big job to, to do so. And we could define 122 different KPIs uh, on, the, uh, on the smart city management. Like you, you said just before, it's very important to, to be able to measure uh, the effectiveness of what we are doing on smart cities. And now we are going forward. Thanks to another tool from, uh, from Etsy and European Commission, which is uh, specialist task forces, which uh, can work on uh, position papers from the users. And they can, from these position papers, make the technical specification we need. So that's very easy to use and very uh, uh, interesting for us as users. We don't know exactly how the standardization works, at least at the beginning. So we are about to produce another uh, specification through a global KPI, um, global KPI for smart cities. So from the different KPIs we defined before, we are looking at, uh, at three global KPIs to be able to compare the, the cities and the smart cities development between them. And the other one is uh, focused on uh, 5G and how to deploy femtos, uh, 5G femtocells on light poles. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to, to, to use light poles to deploy the, the 5G femtocells. So we are looking at something which would be standardized. Well, let's look at the brain now. I was talking about the Uban platform. The Uban platform we looked after in 2016 uh, thanks to a European project which is called Espresso. And Espresso first gave us this kind of scheme which for us was totally incompatible with what we wanted to achieve. So we work with the people from the project and we finally found it was easier to uh, think like this and to define just three different domains uh, and an interoperable platform. The first one, the lower one, is about how to catch the data. So it's IoT and the data from the legacy systems. Those data are coming into a data storage, a data lake, and then the question is how to access to those data and how to use them for the people. Um, there was a very interesting study from the NIST which explained that we don't need to standardize everything in such a, a system. We just need to focus on what they call uh, the pivotal point of interoperability. So if you look at the three layers, and if you focus on the two pivotal points of interoperability, you've got the solution. So we have to define a northbound, and we have to define a southbound. And once you have those two different PPI, you will get the results you were waiting for. To uh, make sure that uh, this was interesting for us, in 2017, Bordeaux uh, 
launch of in a procurement in order to equip a smart city district in the north of the city. Uh, the specificity of this district is that it was um, a district dedicated to events uh, with uh, an exhibition center, um, a stadium. Uh, so this was a territory which was not always used by the people, but uh, when people came, we had to have very good infrastructures and very good services uh, for many and many people. So it was a dense area from times to times. And in 2017, we launched this call to equip uh, the lightings, so to equip 220 lampposts, to equip EV charges, to equip the street access control management, uh, to equip energy management uh, in the public building, in fact, to, to manage the boilers of the public buildings and to manage meters of water, gas, electricity, and the beans. And the procurement was launched, and we just wrote in the technical, um, uh, in the technical assets we were waiting for, that the sensors connectivity to the IoT network had to be compliant with 1M2M specifications release too. It was published in 2000, which was published, sorry, in 2016, and describes the standardized API. And we also uh, gave the, the URL. Eight different uh, providers answers to this, uh, to this call. So many uh, telecommunications, electricity providers, um, smart lighting management uh, providers and so on and at the end we were a bit worried about the results but at the end one of them SPI answered properly he was compliant to 1M2M and it was the cheapest and the best technical one of all the different solutions we had it was the only one compliant with 1M2M. Now, we, deplow, we deployed from this, uh, from this time this architecture. I won't detail it uh, today, but the interesting point is that we can address different services depending on different departments of the city, which was the main goal of uh, uh, the call. We wanted to get something which was cross-cutting. Uh, we wanted to master the data acquisition. Uh, and we used different networks to do so. A LoRaWAN network, which is managed by the city administration. And we could also use uh, 3G uh, for uh, some features which was not connectable to, to LoRa. And this is something you can see in Bordeaux now, which is uh, working, that colleagues from uh, India, from Hyderabad, came and visited one month before, in July. July. In July. Uh, well, so if uh, you are interested, do not hesitate to contact me. So this is what gives confidence in uh, investment. But this is only the southbound I talked about. We have to take care about the nows bound. Once we have collected all this data, what do we do with this? And this is the second uh, standardized solution we looked after. It's uh, an industry specification group, which is called Context Information Model, and um, an interface, which is NGSILE. I will explain what means NGSILE, because it's a new generation standardized interface, linked data, which is more, uh, if you, I can there, I would make a, a shortcut, but it's just to more look at the properties of the data than, than at the data by themselves. So it's more important to know what the data are linked to than to know what is inside the data. If you get raw data, 
uh, you can't make an exploitation if you don't know if it's from a lamp post, it's from an EV charger, it's from a smartphone, it's from, well. So we have to be very uh, focused on the properties of the data. And thanks to this uh, NGS ILD, we mm, and another uh, European project, which is uh, uh, Synchronicity. Synchronicity is a Euro European project with uh, the goal is to deploy large scale IoT pilots. And we, uh, we could, through the framework of this program, um, compete uh, in a call dedicated to how to manage and exploit the data from this data lake. And we succeeded uh, with a, a, a solution which is Jane based on AGS LED. There is a use case which is more understandable for you, I think, uh, which is about EV charging. When you are an EV driver, the most important for you is to know what, when, and where you can recharge your car. And the application we developed uh, thanks to Jane is just to associate data from EV chargers, so to know if it's compatible with my car, from the car manufacturer for the same purpose, from Meteo forecast, uh, to know if uh, um, to take care and take into account temperature, rainy situations and so on. So if you aggregate all those data, you can give the driver the best EV charger you will be able to find and to drive him to this point. So this is a specific use case. Uh, and we were three cities uh, associated in this call, so Bordeaux, Geneva, in Switzerland, and uh, Songdam in South Korea. Uh, I think uh, perhaps Songmyun will sp talk about, I hope so, uh, in this presentation. Well, so with those two solutions, 1M2M on the southbound and uh, uh, NGSLD on the northbound, we now can uh, think about um, uh, rolling out those uh, type of infrastructures in the in the city, because we we could um, see that was operational at the uh, the territory of the of the north of Bordeaux. Well, just to conclude, what's next? Um, in order to to roll out this uh, this next network, we are looking at building a true multi-service network thanks to the standardization too. Uh, in fact, always to manage our own data because we are responsible to manage the citizen data based on a combination of fiber and 5G and using cities assets. We are very much looking at uh, um, those infrastructures we call as a service um, because uh, it's no more the city administration we will be able to to pay for all these uh, infrastructures, but we need also to associate uh, the utilities, the private sector, and to create um, um, PPP, in fact, in order to uh, install and manage those next generation of, uh, of lamp posts. So I put a link if you want to know more. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, for sharing with us your enlightening perspectives of smart city implementations in Metropole Bordeaux and EuroCities. Our next speaker in this session is Mr. V. Ragunandan who is currently the Deputy Director General, International Relations in the Department of Telecommunications, Government of India. He plays a key role in multilateral telecom relations with various intergovernmental agencies and countries, which include BRICS, ASEAN, the Commonwealth, ITU, APT, etc. 
He has over 30 years of experience in various capacities in the field of telecommunications, including telecom policy implementation, telecom enforcement, and project executions across India. He was recognized by the Department of Telecommunications with the Vishisht Sanchar Seva Padak Award for meritorious services across remote rural areas in India for telecom development. An alumnus of National University of Singapore, he speaks at various international telecom conferences across the world. Currently, he is the focal point in the Department of Telecommunications for ITU and the other international agency and closely coordinates in organizing international conferences, meetings and events both in India and abroad. So, may I please request you to address us all on standardization in smart city global perspective. Yes, sir. Of course. Thank you, ma'am. Let me thank uh, C. Dot for actually inviting me for this uh, session today. Mr. Arundhim is here. I think uh, uh, I was supposed to come. Um, I, my due apologies that I was supposed to come yesterday for the IoT session. I could not come due to some other preconditions. And uh, I'm wondering actually uh, whether I. Uh, I should come for this session and uh, talk as a speaker, come as a speaker or as an audience in the, this one. And seeing the enlightenment of my sitting in the audience would have been much better, I was just thinking. But I, however, I was asked to give some, share my thoughts on this, uh, being in the DOT in the ministry. So I thought that few thoughts I uh, will uh, share with you. And uh, fortunately, Mr. Rahul is here. And uh, Rahul, you have given your uh, uh, initial presentation giving a holistic picture of what you want, you, what you intend to do. I have, I have noticed at one point that uh, I am happy to say that uh, you are working with TC and then C dot. So that is one point which I am uh, happy to see that uh, they are the persons, they are the organizations, uh, of course BIS is also there here. But as far as the telecom perspective is concerned very clearly, CDOT and TEC have uh, done in-depth work on this uh, standardization and I have uh, attended various uh, global meetings across uh, to share with all of you. In fact, uh, yesterday's session was IoT and today is the smart city and then uh, we had, at, I, when I attended the plenipotentiary resolution in ITU recently, there were two different resolutions initially moved. One, I think my colleague Kishore is also here. We moved a resolution on smart cities separately and there was a resolution on IoT. But ultimately, I would, uh, it was felt that uh, by ITU and the global community's uh, wisdom that we should combine this uh, IoT and smart cities. Though we put our uh, arguments uh, that smart cities is an integrated uh, holistic solution, IoT is a part of the smart cities, smart cities uh, cannot be a part of IoT. So there was, the debate continues. So that debate is on, but however, the broad agreement is that instead of a one part of the other, both together complementarily work each other was the resolution decision. So that resolution uh, has been adopted. Now again, I am just uh, trying to see here and comprehend. Uh, uh, Madam has raised one question in the morning, whether uh, uh, from my colleague from TSDSA, TSDSA is here and then uh, CDOT are there. Uh, the adoption, uh, the, the whole whole aspect is on the standardization part. And uh, I was just uh, flabbergasted when the answer was for her question was, I typically gave a very uh, reply, which is very, what you all heard about that, whether you accept, uh, the high, highest, the, the huge adoption is our uh, strength, huge adoption. That, so whether we should go for a huge, the, the model where whether innovations how to continue and whether the standardization process has to be adopted. So there is a, there is a uh, always uh, uh, debates going on on this issue. Do allow without a standardization or to work with the standardization? So the answer definitely, if you have just seen that, answer has to be early, huge adoption means again, there is a particular standard which has been hugely adopted. So that gives the answer that standardization is required. So we need to have a standardization. So in order to protect the investments, in order to move forward, in order to have a... Again, the, uh, my colleague from... Uh, I was just uh, again thinking whether again he was mentioning 
interoperability is a question again whether interoperable it has to be interoperable or not to be the debates are being uh, uh, many debates are happening actually so whether again from the government perspective we always feel that okay in order to have uh, interoperability is uh, uh, the, the questions are raising and then we are just trying to think and then comprehend. All of us are trying to comprehend in this uh, get together that interoperability is again man, uh, is a requirement because again somebody has to come and then invest and then take forward. So maybe in future uh, from the, if you see the 5G perspective and IoT perspective where the uh, billions of devices are going to come in the picture. And if there are no standards followed at all, it is going to be utter chaos. Utter chaos and then the managing, somebody has to take the ownership of uh, the management. I am happy that you, from the urban development ministry perspective, you are taking the ownership of the holistically. That, But as far as the ICT perspective is concerned, this city has to be, there are cities, city will become smart only if the component of ICT comes into the picture. It is obvious. The obvious that ICT component comes into picture, it becomes smart. Otherwise, they are all differently uh, functioning. And in that sense, actually, you need to have certainly, the, the view is that the emerging, I have attended many debates across the globe, that uh, the view is that uh, standardization and interoperability are uh, certainly essential for this. So in that sense, I am happy that you are moving forward. And uh, in India, and again, uh, in the nascent stages of uh, smart city development, 100 smart cities, we have already planned and conceived. We need to move forward cautiously and then see that uh, the investments are protected in the initial sense. Otherwise, the, again, I mean, uh, if you don't adopt such kind of a strategy of uh, the development of uh, smart cities, then each one will work in silos and then uh, they will not be able to uh, interoperable work. And one city will function in a different way, another city will function in a different way. This needs to be very closely discussed. And uh, I was fortunate to actually attend some meetings in uh, Water Resource Ministry, uh, where Mr. Nitish Kumar was earlier here uh, uh, in the Ministry of Communications. He was PS to our Honorable Minister, and he is now JS there. So we also discussed that. My colleague, Mr. Sushil Kumar, had given a presentation during that time. So again, it was the debate is always that we should work together towards the standardized. Uh, uh, standardization and then adopt the standardization. In that sense, of course, it can be technology agnostic. The as far as the uh, smart cities are concerned, you cannot depend definitely on one technology to be being adopted. The common service layer which uh, CDOT has developed, which is uh, that, that to my uh, perspective, uh, that it is uh, definitely essential. That in and my EU colleagues are here. Many EU colleagues. My colleague is here also. And 1M, uh, 2M, you are all partner of that. Uh, I need not have to emphasize that and then say that, okay, uh, there need not be standardization, you cannot say that. Because you are already, we, we all work together and then, then only develop the 1M, 2M and then uh, CDOT has worked towards that and then developed a CCSP, if I remember correctly, common CDOT common service platform. So CCSP. And uh, Mr. Rahul, once again, I'm, another point which I am telling is, there are several different verticals where, is the, where we have showcased a single, on a single platform the different verticals. And here again I must uh, be proud to say that CDOT, just in front of, I was just going through, I just saw that uh, many of the people had come here and then they have not seen those, all those uh, whatever has been displayed there. And one thing which definitely, which attracted me on that is Smart City uh, uh, implementation project, uh, project as a whole. If you see the, on a one common service platform, they have Im interconnected, if I remember, at least eight to nine, sir, uh, Mr. Tagi, sir? Ten services. Ten services. Ten services they integrated and showcased. I think it's worth watching. While going, uh, I would request you to just see that uh, because it gives a, a holistic idea how the intro, uh, how these uh, so many services have been uh, integrated and then connected on a common service uh, pl platform. That gives a confidence to, because ultimately we are all debating so whether to adopt and uh, what to adopt and uh, when to adopt and then how, what are the strategies to be followed. From the ministry, definitely I am very much concerned about that. So that's why I just thought that I will speak on that first. So when I was asked to speak, so that is one of my, uh, uh, in the sense, no, uh, take away from this, uh, today's uh, 
participation uh, both as a speaker and then uh, as an audience in the morning. So as you see that again, uh, another point, uh, morning Wi-Fi was shared uh, that uh, Madam had raised a question whether uh, it is a part of the writ. Madam, you asked about the uh, Wi-Fi, this uh, IEEE will go Wi-Fi as a writ, part of it. This is a devastating question actually. So if it, if it is or if it is not, so again, the uh, thing is that Wi-Fi is going to definitely pervade and then work uh, across the platform, across the, the it will become uh, in the sense, no? uh, India has uh, planned uh, as per the national uh, digital telecommunication policy, what we have planned also, at least millions of, uh, one million minimum is the target which we are putting and then the millions of uh, Wi-Fi hotspots have to come. So in that sense also, again, uh, we need to have a, definitely we need to move forward as per the global uh, development and definitely from one operator model, I don't know, I can't just now imagine. So there are, we come, came back from 10 operators to 4 operators now, more or less. Now again in the 5G and in the, in the future, it is going to be a different uh, type of uh, models um, emerging. It may not be, it may be at the core of it, uh, maybe 4 operators and then uh, we need to see. Uh, uh, how best actually, how best we have to move forward and then the challenges in the smart cities is that there will be n number of uh, stakeholders and the actors and the players coming in and then how to manage that all will work only if you have a standardized platform, standardized approach to the security and the standardized approach to the device uh, development. So this definitely has to be there, then only we can take ownership of it and then only we can manage it. So otherwise, this is going to create a definitely difficult task for us. So we must we must move forward thinking that in a holistic and uh, integrated approach. So certainly we have to move forward. And I would urge that uh, the uh, uh, all the partners here, especially my EU colleagues who have been a partner to this uh, 1M2M platform to take forward uh, this and uh, see that it, it is uh, it becomes the global standard. And then for that, whatever steps are to be taken, so that India also adopts at the earliest the global standard. Because it has to be, whatever we adopt again, it cannot be India standard. Definitely it has to be India standard, no doubt. It has to have a global uh, compatibility. So in, the, in this context, I would urge all of them to move forward in that and then see that uh, whatever to be done from India to work together with them on the international plat platforms, we, can, we are definitely certain to work with them. So we had a discussion uh, even on the BRICS platform, I had discussed with all the BRICS nations also, adoption of this uh, 1M2M uh, um, uh, to be made it as a global standard for adoption and many countries we had already discussed this and then we are, I am very sure that uh, we can move forward in this direction and uh, this debate I think uh, may continue and I, th I thought that just few thoughts uh, I will share uh, uh, having uh, come here. Thank you very much again. Thank you, sir, for sharing with us your insights into the various aspects of standardization in the implementations of smart cities. Our next speaker will give a video talk, Mr. Song Mong Jong, who is a senior researcher in IoT Platform Research Center at Korea Electronics Technology Institute, KT. Before joining KT, he worked as a researcher at Advanced Standard R&D Lab, LG Electronics in Seoul, South Korea for six years. His research interests are in the areas of IoT middleware platforms like 1M2M and interworking technologies. He has been the active member of 1M2M standardization right from the beginning and now he is the vice chairman of 1M2M architecture working group. Not just 1M2M standardization, he is also involved in R&D projects pertaining to semantic interoperability collaborating EU consortium and cognitive IoT R&D projects in Korea. Recently, he is focused on IoT-enabled smart cities and smart city innovation growth engine program. Let us now connect with Mr. Song Mong Jong for his talk focused on Busan, Korea. If you're watching this, that means 
there's something happened. So you're kind of watching my presentation recording. So I don't want or I don't hope you are watching this, but just a plan B. Uh, I'm recording this. So this is the presentation for the one in smart cities in South Korea. And I had a couple of different occasion or opportunity to introduce uh, one in terms smart cities in South Korea before. And the first one was the smart city uh, related workshop held in Delhi in 2017. And I was invited and I uh, introduced three different smart city pilot projects in Korea. And after that, the other one was in this June. And I had a couple of updates and yeah, I made a presentation to the other uh, workshop from Indian community. And this is my third, and I also kind of updated a couple of more slides with the other case studies in Korea. And that's it. And today I'm going to introduce uh, four different cities in South Korea. And luckily, uh, I cover one commercial deployments, while the other three cities are the pilots. Uh, projects. And that's not the all Korean 1M team smart cities deployments. There should be more, but those four cities are the cities that I know and that Katie aware of because somehow we were involved with those projects, so we know those cities. But since there are many one team solutions out there in Korea, Korean market. So there would be more case studies, I think. And if we kind of extend the definition of the smart city, not just the transportation or smart home, smart park, something, something, but if we kind of look over there, like the electricity or water utility, then there would be uh, more cases that we can talk about. For example, this is the TR0036 in one term, and the title is Adaptation of one term for Smart City. And when you look at the latest version's uh, table of contents, in clause 6, we have different kind of deployments and the one in the middle, one transport, will be followed after my presentation. And this is the case study from the UK. And the other ones are all from Korea. And today, I'm going to talk about Busan, Goyang, Daegu, but not the healthcare, but the other one. And I don't cover this one, electricity and the water, but you can find information from this TR statistics. So coming back to this slide, I'm going to start my presentation now. And I'm working for Katie, and I've been the working group two vice chairman since the architecture working group. Now architecture became SDS uh, version with the protocol and security. So uh, again. I'm going to talk about four different cities, and the first one is Busan. And in Busan, there was the uh, pilot project funded by government. And the project duration was from 2015 January to 2017, the end. So it lasts three years. And in Busan, Busan is the second largest city in South Korea, so it's really big. And there are many districts. And one of the famous districts, especially for the tourism, is Haeundaegu. And in Haeundaegu, uh, there was the pilot project deployments. And the pilot project coordinator was SK Telecom. In Korea, we have three big telecom companies, and the 
majority, the biggest one is the SK Telecom. And they were the coordinator for this pilot project and ran uh, the project for three years. If you see the map on the left corner, and you can find the marker where you can find Busan city. So this one is South Korea, and Seoul is above here, the capital city, and Busan is on the other direction. And yeah, again, Busan is the second biggest city in Korea. And on the right corner, you can find the snapshot of the Busan Global Smart City website. This one, and they also uh, run the data portal. So let's go to the website quickly. So this is the first uh, website from Busan Global Smart City. And luckily they have English web page. So depending on your location, I think at the first page that you can find would be the English page, I think. There are several materials like the uh, video and several news. And of course, you can find the platform a bit more details. What was the platform like the 1M, 2M here and there, which will be explained shortly from me. And there are several services, description written in English. So you can find those description yourself and the second web page for the Busan smart city is the data uh, portal so the domain starts with data dot and sadly I don't see any English web page but basically what they open is the introduction to the smart city data and how to use those data service on this portal and what kind of data uh, categories are kind of provided like the safety, digester, uh, and transportation, the other transportation, something, something, and the energy. And when you go to the open API, then you can find the button to submit your application to use the open API and some simple. Uh, developer guide, something. So there's the two different websites for the Busan Smart City project. And on the top, you can find the system deployment and the configuration. So on the left side, or left hand side, you can find the device platform and cube, which is part of the open source component from Ocean open source community in Korea, led by Cathy. And this is the gateway platform. And on the server side, there's the Thing Plug, which is a commercial product, 1MPM compatible server uh, from SK Telecom. So there's the 1MPM platform, and here's the 1MPM platform. Of course, they communicate over the 1MPM standard API over HTTP and MQTT. And there are several device types. And in the platform, of course, the core itself is the 1M team platform. And also, the city platform consists uh, with the application platform. And on the top or on the right hand side, there are several service applications that you can find. Uh, like here and there. So since the project lasts three years, there are kind of many services deployed and many of them are safety related services like here. And the other one, the other category would be the traffic management and the urban living and the energy related ones. And in the third year, there are the other services in the last or the third year. And the project ended in the end of 2017, but still in 2018 and 
uh, one of the organization is uh, still maintaining or coordinating the pilot services, extended ones, something like this. And the other SMEs that want to kind of test or preparing their commercial products or offerings, they are using the platform deployed in Busan. The other one is Daegu, and compared to the previous uh, presentation that I made before, now I'm going to talk about the, the other deployment, Susong Alpha City, at the healthcare pilot project. But still, this is another pilot project, and this happened last year, and one of the Daegu district is Susong Group. And also, this one led by SK Telecom, and just for information, in Daegu City, Daegu is really uh, trying several different smart city projects uh, inside the city. Uh, not in my slide, but uh, in Daegu, there are the other kind of commercial deployments for the smart park service. But sadly, I didn't get the open material at the moment, so Probably, if I have another chance, then I can present the commercial deployment in Daegu. But today, I'm going to talk about the other pilot project in Daegu City. So you can find the location of the Daegu right here. And for the Daegu Susong Alpha City, Alpha City, I have two different websites. One is the project. Uh, description and the other one is the kind of developer website. Sadly, they don't have English website at the moment. And again, this is the uh, main website, degosmartcity.kr. And when you go to the platform, you can find the smart city concept and the difference from the other Korean. Uh, smart city solution and the uh, smart city platform composition and you can find what I can write here for their smart city in this city the pilot project they are uh, trying or testing intelligent state pedestrian service and unmanned parking management service like detecting illegal parking in the downtown area and do something to help the traffic condition uh, in the city. Uh, in the developer website that you saw right here, uh, there are several tools for the developer on the portal like device registration to connect their devices to the OneMTM platform and service registration and configurable dashboard, then they can kind of build up simple services for the monitor. The third city that I want to uh, explain is Goyang, and you can find the location of Goyang right here. So this is basically near so next to Seoul, but uh, Direction-wise, this is uh, northwest from Seoul, and the project lasts two years before, since 2016-2017, and this one led by LG U Plus, which is the third biggest uh, mobile operator in Korea, and this one started. Uh, the next year from the Busan Hyundai Smart City project and their service team was aiming for the environment friendly smart city services and you can find the smart uh, Goyang city website right here and if I go there so this is the website and they also have the English website and they are talking about their smart city project and the services. A couple of them are still written in Korean, but you can find some diagram or illustration, then you can understand somehow. And also, they are 
talking about the smart city support center consists with some startup uh, developer support center and operation center promotion then you can kind of visit and see what's going on and the monitoring room something like that and they also operate the data portal like the Busan Smart City and also I don't see the English menu but the basic concept is the same as Busan Smart City so you can find some open data from the one mtm platform deployed in Goyang City So uh, again, uh, environment-friendly services has been deployed uh, as a catchphrase for the Goyang Smart City and several service uh, deployment configuration and the uh, screenshot for the smart phone applications. And uh, the other one, probably the last uh, city that I'm going to talk about today would be Yongin. And Yongin is next to, probably next next to Seoul, and basically southeast from Seoul. And this is the commercial deployment. Even the uh, service deployment area is not so big, but still, I think this is something because this is not a pilot project. And there's a kind of consortium member from Guan Smart City project, and one is the platform provider M2M, M2M, and the other one is the Mosquito kind of service provider with the Mosquito counter device. You can see that one in the next slide. And that has been deployed in Guan City before, and so. That's what I mean by verified. And the Yongin Smart City, uh, they deployed this service with the one mtm based uh, platform. So this is the service uh, composition and the dashboard that is running in Yongin City. So basically they want to kind of collect uh, data to kind of estimate the density or some kind of mosquito problems in the city here and there, some reservoirs or the other places that they suffer from mosquito. So basically this is a mosquito counter device and this one emits CO2 and uh, collects some mosquito and when mosquito uh, uh, kind of collected into the device there's a infrared uh, kind of counter or detection uh, sensor working for the mosquito which is a really small insect and there's a counter uh, in the device there are also the sensor for the temperature and humidity and co2 so they collect uh, those data and kind of predicts when there should be more and more mosquitoes or there will be less mosquitoes. And I think this should be the dashboard. And the, this device is deployed in different area and they get data, real time, and do some kind of estimation and prediction. At the moment, the prediction is done by huge degree from this machine uh, uh, vendor. But uh, as I heard, they are preparing to kind of endorse uh, machine learning, having a dedicated uh, prediction model for this service. That's it for four different cities in Korea adopting one twin. And if I add a couple of things just verbally uh, from Katie's perspective, uh, we are uh, doing one of the smart city project using one twin uh, with the European members and the project name is Synchron City. In the last year, we uh, extend several 
features like the geo query in the one m ten platform and at the moment we kind of added a new functional requirements for one m ten specification to add those geo query related features and we have the deployments and the related service especially the smart parking service and this year in the term of synchronicity Korean side, we are developing the data marketplace enabler on top of 1M2M as an extended API. And also we are adapting the NGSI LD from Etsy uh, because that has been uh, designed or uh, implemented uh, for the smart city data driven platforms. So even I didn't kind of include that one because that's only from Katy side. But if you're interested, or if you're interested in the other four cities that I kind of introduced today, then please uh, give me a contact. Then I can at least uh, give some answers over the email. Thank you. We thank Mr. Song Mong Jong for connecting with us in this conference. Our next session is again a video talk by Mr. Dale Seed, who is a principal engineer at InterDigital, where he participates in several M2M IoT industry standards bodies, including 1M2M, 3GPP, IETF, and ETSI. He's an active contributor working to define technologies that are helping shape and enable the Internet of Things. Dale currently serves as chairman of the 1M2M System Design and Security Working Group. Prior to InterDigital, Dale has held positions at Intel and Lucent Technologies. As an employee of InterDigital, he is also a member of Convida Wireless, which is a joint venture partnership between InterDigital and Sony, focused on researching the future IoT technology areas. Let us now connect with Mr. Dale Seed for his talk on European deployment one transport. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dale Seed, and I'm from InterDigital. I believe I've met or spoken with many of you in recent talks and discussions focusing on various 1MDEM topics. And I wanted to say thank you once again for the opportunity to speak with you today. For today's talk, I'd like to give you some more information about the One Transport Data Marketplace solution. First, some high level overview, along with a bit of history about One Transport. One Transport is a 1M to M based smart city service. It's commercially deployed in the UK with plans for future expansion as well. The One Transport solution offers a data marketplace for the sale and exchange of transportation centric data. And the service enables data owners to publish their historical data as well as their real time data such that it can be discovered and accessed by other data enhancers and consumers. Cordon is the company that commercially deploys One Transport along with several of its partners. And Cordon is a, a separate and dedicated smart city centric company that was spun off from InterDigital. Before its commercialization, if we look back a little bit at the history, One Transport started off as a UK government funded smart city project, and that was made up of several partner organizations, including InterDigital as well as others. The project was very successful, and it resulted in a pre commercialized solution. When the project concluded in 2017, Cordant began the commercial deployment of the One Transport solution. As part of the deployment, uh, Cordant commercially hardened and scaled out the solution and added, added several commercial centric features. Uh, for example, it, it added a framework for data owners to offer licensing terms for their data, as well as the ability to charge and bill others for accessing and using their data. Presently, the commercial deployment uh, service it services about 300 data providers 
uh, having both real-time and historical data feeds uh, feeding into as well as out of the one transport service as well as many different types of data consumers uh, that are accessing the data and making use of the data to build uh, exciting applications with it. So leveraging the one transport data marketplace enables many types of transportation centric services, such as those related to traffic congestion management, parking, connected autonomous vehicles, just to name a few. If we take a little bit closer look at the, uh, the one transport solution, the commercially deployed service is, again, it's, it's deployed by Cordant and it's powered by the Cordant IoT platform, which is based off of the 1M2M standard. The service uses the underlying Cordant platform, uh, which is hosted in Microsoft Azure Cloud to achieve uh, commercial scaling and reliability and availability. The platform can be accessed by various types of stakeholders, such as transportation authorities, application developers, car OEMs, insurance companies, uh, just to name a few. These stakeholders create products and services that help enable new and exciting product offerings, um, such as improving travel experiences for, for many different commuters. One transport, uh, just to be clear, it's, it's, it's not an application or uh, it's just a service. Rather, it's the, the goal of one transport was more to form an ecosystem uh, consisting of data providers, enhancers, and consumers, and breaking down the barriers to entry and opening up the marketplace for um, these different stakeholders to uh, provide their services, um, you know, at a, at a, at a, at a, using a freemium model where it would be free of charge or at a premium uh, type of model where, where they could charge and, and, and create revenue streams from this. So if we take a look at the, the different stakeholders, um, you know, at a high level, there are data providers that import their data into the one transport service, as well as data enhancers, which access the data from data providers then enhance that data and publish the data back into the service uh, to provide higher level, more valuable data. A good example of this would be like an analytic service provider. Likewise, there's data consumers who, uh, who simply use one transport just to access data and retrieve and pull data out of the service and use that data to enable uh, the ability for them to, to use the data within their applications. So through this ecosystem of data providers, data enhancers, and data consumers, uh, it creates a, uh, a cyclical type of environment where these data feeds um, that are created, that they build upon themselves, you know, starting with lower level data that gets enhanced and building higher level data, which in turn creates more valuable data and the process continues and repeats. Using this ecosystem, uh, innovation then thrives a community of data providers and answers and consumers and it creates uh, as, as i mentioned before uh, a simpler go-to-market path and an opportunity for for uh, revenue generation so if we take a closer look at what technology is enabling the one transport service here on this slide we see that uh, we have uh, the cordon iot uh, platform which again is, is a one m to m standards based platform it's supporting uh uh, the core capabilities of the 1FDAM standard, uh, especially those focusing in on the data management plane um, to allow the, the data brokerage uh, aspects of the one transport service, but it also offers you know, additional services such as security, as well as eventing for subscriptions and notification uh, functionality, as well as some of the, st the statistic collection and charging, and discovery, um, and, and various others. Layered uh, along with the Cordon IoT data platform is a, a web services portal that uh, is the, the forward facing uh, portal for the service. And this basically uh, exposes the, uh, the Cordon IoT APIs to the subscribers and, and of, of, of the service and uh, provides functionality such as the, uh, the licensing and the pricing, um, the subscription and the enrollment of the users and the, uh, the front ends for the, for the usage and the metrics and the billing. So together, the, uh, the web portal, along with the Cordon IoT platform, make up the other uh, one transport service. Some types of applications that are enabled by one transport uh, include 
things such as enhanced wayfinding, including routes and parking, accident prevention and awareness, enablement for autonomous vehicles, congestion and pollution reduction, transit sharing, and optimized road maintenance and safety management. So on the next few slides, let's take a little bit of a closer look at a couple of these examples. Here on this slide, I'm showing a use case involving one transport being used to manage uh, high traffic volumes. For example, uh, a smart city command and control center can observe congestion data from live traffic streams, process this data using predictive analytics, and then make adjustments to traffic control signals, uh, suggested route signs that are displayed on roadsides, as well as public transportation schedules. All of this, again, can be enabled with the One Transport Service and its coordinate one m 10 based IoT platform, uh, providing the, uh, the data that helps fuel um, the, the applications and use cases such as this one. Here on this next slide, I'm showing another use case. This one involving uh, a method for understanding and providing recommendations for different modes of transportation within a city based on variables such as the traffic congestion, uh, the mass transit schedules and delays, for example, buses and trains, maybe some alternative transportation availability such as the rental bikes or motorized scooters in the city, as well as um, some additional complementary information like the weather um, as well as the air quality and the availability of uh, bike paths and, and things like that in different regions of the city. All of this information, again, being very useful for commuters who are looking to plan their journeys and making day-to-day uh, -day and route-by-route uh, uh, -route decisions um, on, on what options they have and what forms of mobility that they can use to, uh, to perform their commute. And again, all, all, the, all this diverse information can be pulled together through the one transport service and be made readily available and used by various stakeholders and, um, that, that, that take part. Here on this slide, I'm showing the use case for uh, a, a little bit more of a recent type of scenario um, and use case that's making use of the one transport service. And this is uh, one involving connected autonomous vehicles. And um, the, the point I'm trying to get across on this slide is uh, in order for the, the connected autonomous vehicle um, to, to reach its mass deployment and uh, really come to fruition, there's a lot of different stakeholders that, 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 that can play a, a role in that. For example, we have uh, road authorities, intelligent transportation system operators, insurance companies, smart city managers, emergency services, vehicle manufacturers and OEMs, all of these are stakeholders that um, that really would like to either access information, provide information, or enhance information flowing to and from uh, connected autonomous vehicles or the uh, the devices that interact with those vehicles, such as uh, roadside units and sensors. So um, this is another use case that's that's currently uh, where where one transport is being used to, to to pull together this information and allow these stakeholders to share it and, and use it with one another. What I'd like to do next is just show you a brief demo of a one transport enabled application. Um, this application consists of a dashboard that was built as part of a, uh, a smart city command and control center, uh, leveraging the one transport uh, service. So here uh, on this dashboard, I'm showing you a map of the greater London area. Um, and, and displayed on this map are various sensors, including vehicle counters, journey time predicting uh, sensors, mass transit monitors, air quality, as well as weather sensors. So uh, a large diverse set of weather sensors, excuse me, uh, a large diverse set of uh, various types of sensors. And what we see here, each bubble on this uh, dashboard represents uh, a set of sensors that's deployed throughout the London region. And if you hover, as I hover over each one of these bubbles, you can see that um, the sensors are, are deployed in, 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 in the region that's outlined by that uh, respective area. Now, if we start zooming in on different regions of the city and different areas that have these sensors, 
I can start to show you some different types of functionality that's enabled by uh, the data that's provided by these sensors. For example, in this first case, I'd like to show you some road closure um, type of example where we have different regions of roads that can be closed and information that can be shared and reported about the road closure. For example, uh, here we have a gas leak um, that's taking that, that occurred in a certain part of the city and we have a, a boundary and a perimeter that's been established and, and those roads have been closed uh, due to that gas leak. Also shown on this part of the, of the dashboard is we have different um, bus routes being displayed with the different bus lines through the city and, and information about those bus lines. If we zoom in on a different area of the city, we have, uh, you know, in this case, we've got some information just being displayed about different traffic congestion information. So uh, we've got red, green, and orange uh, being displayed and used for the different road segments. So if we hover over a, a, green, a, a green road segment, we can get some information about um, the fact that uh, the travel time on this particular road is averaging about three minutes, which is the typical travel time for this road segment. Whereas if we go to a different road segment, um, let's say an orange one, we can we can then get some information that basically says that uh, the travel time on this one is uh, is running a bit over the, the normal. So here it's, it's six minutes instead of five minutes. Um, the additional types of information here, I'm also showing some, some, some train information. We can display uh, uh, train information for a different rail, uh, uh, railways throughout the city, as well as if there's any alerts or notifications regarding their, uh, that this railway. Uh, this one is currently suspended and it will resume at uh, a later time and, and scheduled for the morning time. Other things we can display is uh, the, the vehicle counter information. Uh, here we have vehicle counter sensors deployed through the roads that count um, vehicle counts either real time, like I'm showing here, that currently we have uh, about 30 vehicles up, uh, per minute going through this road segment. And also stored in the one transport services is also historical vehicle counter information. Uh, for example, you know, this chart right here is giving you uh, a year to year summary of, of average vehicle counts through, through this particular uh, roadway. This type of information could be used by application developers, not just access real-time information, but also historical information, which could again enable um, uh, different types of use cases. Zooming into a different region of the city, uh, just to show you, uh, you know, there, there's some air quality sensors being deployed here. So these air quality sensors could, can measure things like particulate matter. And then also um, uh, whether that's a low, high uh, type of reading compared to uh, what, what is expected of normal, um, nitrogen dioxide, as well as ozone. Also have some weather sensors in the city and, and that information can be also uh, displayed as well. So all of this information, uh, again, is fueled and, and coming out of the one transport service. And, and all of it is, is based off of uh, a data schema and model that is standardized by the 1M2M standard. And it's coming from devices that are either native 1M2M devices, or in many cases, these devices are, are not 1M2M devices. They are uh, traffic sensors that may have been deployed many years ago, and, and that deployed uh, and measure uh, sensor readings in various types of formats. However, when the information is, is inputted into the system, it can be interworked and adapted such that it can be displayed and stored in a, a 1M2M schema-based model, which then al that allows the application developers to just use one consistent model, making their life a lot easier and consistent for them. Along those lines, let me just show you a, a, go a little bit deeper. I, I will go kind of into the one, into the one transport service and take a look at the data brokerage and data sets that um, some examples of those that are being stored on this. Uh, I'm looking at the one transport website right now. And these are uh, some example data sets that have been published by various data providers into the system. And each one of these um, has a uh, subscription with the service and they uh, uh, upload and publish their data in, into the one transport service. If we go a little bit deeper and we take a look at an example, uh, here I'm looking at a, uh, a car park 
in the uh, in the city of Birmingham, UK. And if we click on the car park, we see that that car park is modeled as a 1M to M application, and it's using the 1M to M data model and specifically the 1M to M application resource, the AE resource, which is shown here on the right. And this car park is uploading information about the status of the car park. And when it does that, it's uploading it into some data management uh, type resources defined by the 1M to M standard. Here we're showing a container resource for the car park. And within that container resource, there's car park information being uploaded on a periodic basis and being timestamped. So here we're showing things like the occupancy of the car park, as well as the, uh, the percentage full of, of the car park, along with additional information. So this can uh, be used to access real-time information, as well as historical information that's stored in the, in the, in the one transport service. So as you can see from this, um, you know, the one transport service is indeed using the one end-to-end -end standard to store its data in the data model and schema defined by the standard. In addition, the service also offers um, the ability for different pricing models as well as different subscription models into the service based off the type of user and, and what they're looking to do with their data, as well as different licensing models. If, if somebody would like to upload their, their data, depending on uh, how they would like to license their data, uh, the One Transport Service offers different licensing models, for example, the open government license would be one option for them to use uh, to uh, to make their data available and, and have it licensed in a certain manner such that it could be shared. So at, at this time, um, I, I think I'd like to wrap it up. Um, my, my time is up. And I, I, again, I, hopefully you were able to gain a better appreciation of the One Transport uh, offering as well as how it makes use of the 1M to M standard. It was my pleasure to provide you with this information. And again, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, uh, have some questions. If, if, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much. We thank Mr. Dale Seed for connecting with us. Our next speaker is Professor Ramesh Loganathan, who is also the Head of Research Outreach at the International Institute of Information Technology, IIIT Hyderabad. He is also heading the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at IIIT Hyderabad. Prior to IIIT Hyderabad, he was in the tech industry for over 20 years in R&D leadership roles, including that of the Head of India Development Center at Progress Software. In 2000, he moved from Bay Area to Head Engineering at Pramati Technologies. A Master's in Control Systems, he is very active in the startup and innovation ecosystem. He was also the recipient of State Award for Contributions to Startup Causes in 2016. So, may I request you to share with us your experiences in Hyderabad Smart City Initiative. Good afternoon. I think I have the very tough job of keeping everyone engaged for the next, uh, hopefully, 10, 15 minutes max. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I'm standing between uh, now and lunch. So uh, I'm just going to share um, our plans uh, around the Smart City Research Center uh, at uh, Tripati Hyderabad. So um, it's essentially building on different research areas uh, that's already happening, uh, that already that we already have. Tripati is a, it's a research university. We are organized as a set of research centers. Uh, we have about uh, 22 research centers for different areas of computer science, electronics, and few application areas. Uh, we focused on information technology. And uh, we already, had a, uh, already have a smart building uh, research center uh, for many years now. Uh, we have the signal processing center, uh, we have the VLSI and Embedded systems, um, and also the, uh, one of the largest research group for AI uh, in the country. And um, so all of these kind of converge um, in, uh, like all of these have opportunities in uh, smart city uh, uh, solutions. And um, 
the uh, the whole idea for the smart city resource center happened uh, in a visit which is funded was funded by the indo eu ict uh, project we have an iot uh, coe at triple uh, it set up by the indo eu uh, project and uh, myself uh, sachin and aftab two other faculty here and vishal four of us had gone to uh, uh, to france uh, we were at class nrs and uh, bordu we were theory at class and uh, we met with christoph uh, at bordu as well and uh, that's where the idea kind of took uh, shape uh, to kind of create a larger research center that brings all these areas together um, uh, towards smart city solutions and the opportunity itself is the smart city mission uh, that rahul is here from uh, uh, which is now looking at 100 cities uh, being in the process of being set up as smart cities uh, with multiple uh, facets and um, and that provided a nice context and specifically we identified there was some research work underway in different centers already at reply t uh, relating to smart cities and um, so we said why not we bring all of those together and and two specific areas was our focus uh, one was like smart poles uh, smart buildings uh, in general especially in campus environment multiple buildings and smart poles uh, so these were two areas and uh, and again the focus was on trying to get the data and and the ai uh, solutions possible around the data so those were the broad areas uh, that we identified and uh, so we decided to set up the center and it's already underway and um, uh, and the the primary objective is being to bring these different technology areas together towards smart cities research i mean like a lot of solutioning is happening uh, but application of research uh, at least in our uh, water we have uh, kind of scanned around not as much is happening around bringing research to bear uh, to the smart cities and and that's what this was so a research center sitting on the campus uh, and the whole campus being a living lab it was we were planning to set it up as a smart campus and now we got connected to mit and uh, smart city missions living lab proposal uh, and our smart campus is going to be the phase 1 of the living labs being proposed by mit and smart city mission uh, we'll have the uh, the first phase of it ready by uh, end of this year uh and we're also going to converge on uh, we have active uh, uh, dialogue with la cnrs which is doing a lot of work uh, around uh, uh, smart buildings and and broader uh, whole iot based uh, uh, management of buildings uh, and also with bardu uh, specifically around the standards 1m 2m standards so so those were some of the collaborations identified uh, so the elements of the smart city lab is essentially around uh, joint research specifically 1m 2m standards uh, for india uh, pilots at scale uh, we've already tied up with uh, with the city of hyderabad Uh, they were agreed to be an extended pilot for anything that we uh, would like to try uh, we have the permissions from them uh, so pilots at scale uh, and then large data sets which is something we don't get easily in india there are not too many public data sets so that is a big part of our focus uh, having large data sets uh, and then allow the uh, startups or larger companies to look at the data and, and create uh, solutions and the whole smart campus as a living lab uh, that's already the efforts already on like i said uh, december is our target for the first phase uh, and then the uh, smart city incubator uh, we already house uh, the largest academic incubator in the country uh, which is 11 years old at reply t and reply t is also a founding institute for t hub which is also at this moment uh, located on our campus so we have two incubators on campus between the two we have nearly 250 startups on campus Uh, and then also very actively connected to the whole city uh, the startup extended ecosystem in the city uh, so we'd like to bring that uh, perspective also to bear uh, to the smart city research center in terms of uh, applied innovation so just looking little bit uh, into each of the uh, the six facets the living lab is a big part of it we believe for us to do anything even uh, to apply research we need a uh, kind of a test bed uh, that is a live uh, test bed not a, a hypothetical Uh, small setup but a whole campus um, so so this is something that we have initiated uh, we like to get different um, uh, aspects of the ca- campus from power to water to street lights pollution uh, we're setting up a, a pollution and weather monitoring as well on the campus um, and uh, the whole power distribution power consumption um, solar we are getting a, there's a large solar power plant coming up the solar so all of this uh, uh, we plan to get onto the system um, and and this is at some level very very largely inspired by what we saw at las uh, cnrs uh, in terms of the the so smart building that they have uh, which has all the live monitoring so we're looking at the whole campus we are a 60 acre campus 2000 residents uh, students and faculty that live on the campus uh, so we want to get the whole campus onto the system uh, and in the process also define the standards uh, so that's a uh, and and leverage the collaborations as we do this uh, like we already have um, yeah, we're going to use indo eu ict project in a big way uh, specifically we have relationship with las cnrs and uh, and through las we also got some connects with uh, insa in toulouse and uh, and of course bordeaux metropole as well in terms of the uh, standards 
So, uh, so joint projects is something that we're looking at. Some projects have already been identified, and we hope in coming years uh, we will expand the, uh, the nature of uh, uh, projects. The standards is a big part. I mean, the whole thing was triggered by the 1M2M uh, uh, kind of initiative. And um, so we're looking at uh, having all the data being collected on campus to be on 1M2M standards. In that process, also define some, uh, hopefully, define some templates that could feed into the standards for, uh, for data to be collected. Because whether it is power and water on campus or power and water in the city, the, the nature of information is similar. Uh, so we hope to uh, uh, use our experience or, or share our experiences into the whole standards uh, definition process that could be used across the uh, country. And now that uh, this is going to be part of the MIT and um, uh, Smart City Missions Living Labs Initiative, we're hoping it will feed more directly uh, into the whole process. So the 1M, 2M standards is a, is a big part of what we're going to be doing in this whole Smart City uh, Research Center. Public data sets, like I said, uh, we have looked uh, at different times for different areas. So there's an initiative uh, across the board uh, within our um, uh, uh, institution. Um, there are no good public data sets, whether it is like traffic or for autonomous driving, uh, road data sets or healthcare related or specific medical, like say cancers or such, imaging or anything, uh, or smart buildings even. Um, there are no public data sets or no good public data sets in India. There's a lot of data available, but they're on private pockets. Uh, with not much of easy access. So we said from the word go, uh, all data we collect uh, is going to be available publicly uh, at the granularity that we are collecting, whatever it is, at whatever granularity we are collecting. We're going to make these data sets available uh, for anybody to look at um, and, and come up with their own solutions uh, or validate, validate the solutions that they might be uh, building, research or um, uh, from the innovation startup uh, ecosystem or even large companies for that matter. Uh, so all the data we're collecting is going to be available uh, publicly. Um, and, and then live data also is going to be available, but that's going to be, since it's live data, that will be a permission based. Uh, but, the, uh, but the archive data sets will be available for anybody to look at uh, and build or validate their solutions. And, and of course the metadata is a key, uh, like we just now saw in the London use case. Uh, I think the models uh, of all the information is also important, so we'll make sure the metadata is available. I think standardizing on 1M2M is going to help uh, anyway. Um, the startup innovation, the whole campus, uh, we were going to make it available. Like I said, we already house about 250 startups on campus, uh, and we're extremely connected with the, uh, with the largest startup ecosystem in the uh, city of Hyderabad. And uh, so we were going to offer uh, the, the whole uh, smart campus to startups to try out their solutions. Uh, like we were, we were planning to have a couple of small sandboxes where it's okay if it fails, uh, if something's break. This for closed loop control. I mean, just to get access to the data is going to be more easily available. Uh, but if they want to control some things, uh, maybe it's lighting in a building or, or, or some energy uh, related uh, controls, those we're planning to have a couple of sandboxes, uh, so where we'll allow them to even control what happens there. Um, and then if the sandbox, it works in a sandbox, then we might allow them to uh, use the larger campus as well uh, to try out the solutions. So, um, so this was our uh, uh, plan, and when we got connected to the, uh, the Mighty and Smart City Missions Living Lab Initiative, uh, so in that meeting, it was decided that there'll be a two-phase or two-stage uh, living lab. Uh, so we'll be the kind of the alpha stage where somebody can try out in a campus setting. And then one of the smart cities is going to be the beta stage uh, living lab, uh, which uh, the Mighty and Smart City Mission will identify. And uh, so there'll be a two-stage living lab. That's the plan. Our first stage is, like I said, is going to be ready, uh, the first phase of it ready by December, and then probably sometime by mid next year, the whole campus will be ready. Uh, and the, the larger city, of course, is a much bigger initiative uh, that might take some time. Um, we'd like to use this uh, for uh, testing out uh, some of the solutions at scale. So we've already got um, the, uh, the Telangana government uh, actually uh, participating and supporting and offering the city uh, to test out. We already have uh, two major projects that started. One is for pollution. Uh, like, I mean, we all know there is no good public data on pollution or even weather. You can get at the city level. Uh, weather is little better. You can get little more than at a finer granularity than at a whole city. But uh, pollution data is almost, from what we understand publicly, I think there are six monitoring stations in the whole city of Hyderabad, which is the fifth or sixth largest city uh, in the country uh, with almost uh, uh, 10 million population. And uh, there are six publicly available pollution data, uh, pollution monitoring data. And uh, so this project uh, is already funded and underway is to create a, a very dense network of uh, low-cost monitoring stations and, and map the whole city. Uh, so the data is only a starting point, uh, pollution and weather data. Uh, but the project is about the, the AI models on top of it uh, to create the predictive models both in uh, space and time. Uh, 
uh, though the sensors may be at half kilometer uh, range, but you still, they're still within half kilometer, so there'll be micro patterns that's going to be projected in terms of what can the pollution be at any given time uh, in, a, in a particular point, which is probably not at the monitoring station. Uh, so prediction in time and space uh, is part of the uh, project. So, and this is going to be deployed, well, the initial few may be happening on our campus, uh, but about few hundred of these will be deployed on, on, on street lights uh, in, the, in the area around the campus, uh, two, three kilometer radius around the campus, and the city has already agreed uh, to deploy these. Uh, and we're hoping to build these as like kind of uh, pilot units, the pole units that we're building, we're hoping that that will feed into the RFP that cities might put out. We don't expect to take this commercially. Uh, we'll deploy the first few hundred uh, and do it, use it for our research work. Uh, but the idea is that the, the smart pole unit could pro possibly be a platform uh, that can be used for RFPs uh, when cities generate RFPs for their smart poles. Uh, so that's the, so pilots at scale. Uh, and of course, anything uh, that is tested on our uh, campus, uh, whether it's a research initiative or a commercial initiative, can also be tested on the smart city living lab that's going to come up as part of uh, the MIT and uh, smart city mission. Um, and I mean, no such initiatives can be successful. At the end of the day, they have to get deployed. Uh, so we are working with large companies. Um, we already had some conversations. A uh, few companies have already agreed to support. Uh, and we are going to use indo EU missions, basically France, because this whole thing got mooted uh, during our visit uh, to France two months back. Uh, some of the French companies, uh, they were going to uh, initiate. Uh, already, Pono Record Foundation is funding some of these projects. It happened prior to our visit, uh, before even our plans to set up a full-fledged uh, smart city research center. So, uh, so this is something we're going to expand. Uh, like I said, conversations are on. Uh, PwC has already agreed uh, their smart city practice. Uh, they're advising almost a third of the uh, 100 smart cities in the country. So they've already agreed to be part of this initiative to advise us on some of the problems. Uh, some of the larger companies uh, like uh, Quantella, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which does many things, including the smart city dashboard, and I believe it's even deployed in the smart city mission uh, headquarters, uh, apart from many cities in India and Europe. Um, so they're a part of it. Uh, they're going to also help us with identifying the problems because uh, we just want to get a real-world perspective on what problems to take up, even uh, in our uh, research. Um, so, so this is something that uh, we are actively connecting as well. Um, and, and through the whole Mighty and Smart City Mission initiative, I'm sure we'll get connected with more uh, uh, companies that will be a part of uh, uh, this, uh, the, the smart campus. So just to conclude, uh, these are things that we're looking at for the phase one uh, in the smart campus. Like I said, weather and pollution monitoring will have few units on campus. We're, like I said, we're not a large campus, 60 acres, uh, but still we'll have a couple of uh, units, uh, monitoring units for weather and pollution. Uh, we're going to have few smart uh, uh, lamp posts. Uh, we are trying to monitor the classroom complex, uh, like where we will know the presence, uh, density of people in the different rooms, and also closed loop automatically switch off uh, AC and power when there's nobody in the classroom. Uh, so we're going to have the classrooms into the system. The whole power distribution on the campus, uh, starting from the main substations uh, all the way till the uh, last level of uh, distribution points, uh, we're going to be tracking and mapping it uh, onto the whole campus uh, map. Uh, likewise, the water distribution. Uh, we have the sums, we have the bore wells, we have the overhead tanks, and major uh, blocks, uh, consumption of water in major blocks. So both sourcing of water as well as consumption of water uh, will get onto the uh, onto this uh, whole smart campus uh, initiative. Uh, we have a big solar power plant that's just being commissioned uh, even as we speak. And uh, so we hope to have that, uh, we plan to have that also onto this whole tracking. So the power uh, production, uh, we can get live stats uh, and also historical uh, data on the uh, solar power pr uh, 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 production uh, on the campus. And the, uh, we have a very, uh, probably one of the best uh, computer vision research groups in the uh, country. Um, so that's something um, we're going to deploy. We haven't yet finalized, but we're hoping at least um, some security and tracking related uh, elements will go in by December, but more will come up next year uh, in terms of as we deploy the uh, cameras on campus. But we're hoping at least a vehicle uh, and people tracking can come in on the campus uh, by, by December. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the plans uh, for our campus, uh, which like I said, is going to be part of the, the, the Mighty and Smart City Missions Living Labs Initiative. This will be hopefully the first uh, official living lab uh, in the country uh, when this comes, uh, goes live by end of this year. So the plans are already on, um, and, uh, and the whole idea is to bring uh, the whole ecosystem together. I mean, with large companies or other research institutions, we're going to be collaborating with other research institutions as well. Uh, government initiatives, uh, like I said, MIT and Smart City Mission, uh, the whole startup ecosystem, uh, bring all of it together um, and see if we can accelerate this whole process of uh, smart city innovation. 
So I hope I did this in 10 minutes. I think I took a little longer, but uh, thank you. Um, I, if any questions uh, or comments, we can take it offline maybe later um, uh, during lunch or so. Thank you so much. And um, two of the other uh, faculty members also here, the Sachin and Aftab. Uh, so this is a, a proposal put together by four of us, uh, Sachin, Aftab, myself, and Vishal. So please do reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for taking us through the Triple IT Hyderabad's Smart City initiatives in such an articulate manner. We thank our eminent speakers for their insightful talks. Considering the time constraints, we will have to skip the Q&A. May I now request Mr. Louis Orke Romero, Director General, European Telecommunications Standards Institute, to formally present a token of thanks and gratitude to our esteemed panelists. Mr. Rahul Kapoor, Director of Smart Cities, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. Mr. Christoph Collinet, Smart City Project Manager, Metropole Bordu. Mr. V. Raghunandan, Deputy Director General, International Relations, Department of Telecommunications, Government of India. <laughs> Professor Ramesh Loganathan, International Institute of Information Technology, Triple IT, Hyderabad. <laughs> we would also like to thank Mr. Song Mon Jong, and Mr. Dale Seed for connecting with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now have a lunch break for 45 minutes, and we shall reassemble here for the next session. Kindly also visit the exhibition outside the auditorium. Thank you.